Okay, let's go ahead and run through an example of a constructive retirement. Um, again, constructive retirement occurs when one party issues debt into the open market and the related party comes along later and buys that debt back on the open market. Now, individually, the issuer still has debt outstanding with each expense. Individually, the buyer of that debt has an investment in the bonds with interest revenue. But from a consolidated standpoint, that debt has been retired. So let's go ahead and go through a quick example. Let's assume that Big owns 80% of Little, and that on January 1st, 20, Little issues $100,000 of 10-year, 10% bonds, at 103, so 103% of face value. And let's assume further that a few years later, on January 1st, 23, Big buys those bonds on the open market at, oh, let's say, 101.4, of base value. So again, on January 1st, 2023, Big buys these bonds in the open market. From a consolidated standpoint, these bonds have been retired. Now, this is something that's gonna be sort of 180 degrees out from what we've talked about with other intercompany transactions. In intercompany asset transactions or intercompany sales of inventory, there is a gain or loss which is recognized by one of the two parties, but which is unrealized, and our job is to remove that gain or loss. In this case, the consolidated entity has a realized gain or loss in retirement, but neither individual company has recognized it. So our job is going to be to put that gain or loss on the income statement. So let's go ahead and first let's figure out how much of a gain or loss there's going to be on this retirement. Now this step isn't absolutely essential because the gain or loss it's going to sort of drop into our laps when we do the elimination entries, but it's nice to sort of you know, make sure we're on the right track. So on January 1st, 2023, how much of a gain or loss will there be if these bonds were bought back at 104? So for that, we're going to have to compare the book value of the debt, or the carrying value of the debt, to the price paid. So the book value, we've got bonds payable, $100,000. Now, initially, there was a $3,000 premium on these bonds, 3%. And that, let's assume straight line amortization just to keep life easy. So that $3,000 premium is going to be amortized over 10 years at $300 per year. So we've amortized 2020, 2021, and 2022. So there's been three years of amortization. So on January 1st, 23, there's still $2,100 of premium left. So these bonds have a book value of $102,400. They're being bought back for 101.4% of face value, or $101,400. And so we're going to have a $700 gain on what's, again, what's called a constructive retirement. And again, our job is going to put is going to be to get the, the debt off of the issuer's balance sheet, get the bond investment off of the buyer's balance sheet, get rid of the interest revenue and interest expense, and put this gain on the consolidated income statement. Now, something that's really helpful to do is let's go ahead and make up a shopping list of what accounts are on the issuer's ledger and what accounts are on the bond buyer's ledger as of the date of the consolidation, the end of 2023. So at 1231.23, um, little the issuer, what do they have on their, on their ledger? They've got bonds payable, $100,000. They've got a premium. Now again, 
this is 2100 on premium. That was as of January 1st. That's being amortized at the rate of $300 per year. So as of January 1st was 2100, by the time the end of the year rolls around, it's down to 1800. And they've also got interest expense. And again, we're assuming straight amortization. So interest expense is going to be the coupon interest plus or minus the amortization. The coupon interest, face value times the stated rate, so 10% of $100,000, $10,000. Premium amortizations reduce interest expense. So interest expense is going to be $10,000 minus $300 or $9,700. So this is what little the issuer has on the ledger at the end of the year. And again, from a consolidated standpoint, this debt no longer exists. We've got to get rid of it. Likewise, on um, big the buyer's ledger, they've got a bond investment or investment in bonds. And a quick T account, they bought this bond investment at 101400 So there was a $1,400 premium on this bond investment. And when they bought these bonds on January 1st, 2023, these bonds had seven years left to run. So that $1,400 premium is going to be amortized over the remaining seven years of the bond's life. $200 per year. So again, this was January 1st. Amortization for the year would be 200. So at the end of the year, the bond investment is down to 101.2. Likewise, Big the Buyer has interest revenue. And again, that premium amortization reduces their interest revenue. So the coupon interest is $10,000 again, minus the $200 of amortization, or $9,800. So this is what the two parties have on their respective ledgers at the end of the year, and this is what has to be eliminated as part of the constructive retirement. So for our elimination entries, we're going to go ahead and just you know, take these out one by one. Bonds payable, we eliminate that with the debit. Premium on bonds, we eliminate that with the debit. Interest expense, we eliminate that with the credit. Investment in bonds, we eliminate that with the credit. And interest revenue, we eliminate that with the debit. Okay, so by doing this, we will, we've removed the bond liability and the bond asset from the issuers and the buyers' balance sheets, respectively, or from the consolidated balance sheet, and we've eliminated the revenue and the expense. Now, this entry doesn't balance. What's missing? Well, what's missing is a $700 credit where we're going to put that gain on retirement on the consolidated income statement. Now, um, one thing before we go any further, two things. First, the date of the purchase is critical. These things are bought on January 1st, 23, which means that the interest expense on the issuer's books is intercompany interest and has to be eliminated. If this took place at December 31st, 23, that means that there wasn't any intercompany interest over the course of the year. We'd simply be eliminating the liability and the asset. But the interest expense would have been paid to or incurred when somebody else, some outside party, owned the bonds. Now, secondly, again, think back to our intercompany, for example, intercompany fixed asset transactions, where we would have a gain on sale of equipment, and that gain would be recognized by adjusting depreciation expense downwards over the remaining life of the asset. We've got sort of the same thing going on here, but again, it's turned 180 degrees. Here, we're putting a $700 gain on retirement on the consolidated income statement. That gain has not been recognized by either big individually or little individually. Big individually has their bond investment and their interest revenue. Little individually has their bond liability and their interest expense. 
the two of them combined are going to be recognizing that $700 gain over the remaining life of the bonds via their disparate interest revenue and interest expense. Again, we're using straight line amortization, so this is going to be fairly straightforward. Look at the interest revenue and interest expense that big and little show every year. Um, big the buyer has interest revenue on their income statement of 9800 Little the issuer has interest expense on their income statement of 9700 So the two companies combined have net interest revenue of $100. And they're going to recognize you know, the net combined interest of $100 interest revenue every year for the next seven years. So that's how the companies individually are going to recognize that $700 gain. Now again, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but in the case of the intercompany fixed asset transactions, we took away a gain and then gave it back over the remaining life of the asset. They were doing the exact opposite. We're giving them the gain up front, and then the individual companies are recognizing it over the over the next seven years. Um, if you want to extend that a little bit further, look at the effect that we have with interest expense and interest revenue this year. We're basically putting a $700 credit on the income table. We're recognizing that $700 gain, and yet we're on the consolidated income table, we're taking it away at $100 per year via their disparate interest revenue and interest expense adjustments. Okay, let's go ahead and go on to 2024. Now again, this is going to be nice and easy because you're using straight line amortization. So what, what's going to change here? Well, the bonds payable stays the same, the interest expense stays the same, and the interest revenue stays the same. All that changes is we've amortized some more of the discount, or in this case, the premium on the bond payable and the premium on the bond investment. The issuer's premium, that's being amortized at the rate of $300 per year. Again, it's a $3,000 premium being amortized over 10 years. So that's now down to $1,500. Likewise, Big the Buyer, they were amortized at the rate of $200 per year. And so their bond investment, again, I got rid of my T account, but trust me on this, their bond investment would now be down to $101,000. Again, we're, we're reducing that by $200 every year for, for the seven years of upcoming bonds. So again, this is the list of accounts that need to be eliminated. And again, I've already got my I've already got my account titles up here, so I'm just going to you know, utilize those again. We eliminate bonds payable with a debit. We eliminate the remaining premium with a debit. We eliminate the interest revenue with a debit. We eliminate interest expense with a credit and we eliminate the investment in bonds with a credit. Now again, this doesn't balance. And again, think back to how we um, carried forward the remaining unrealized gain or loss back when we talked about the company asset transactions. Here, we're carrying forward the remaining realized but unrecognized gain. There was initially a $700 gain on retirement. The individual companies recognized $100 of that, so we're carrying forward $600 of realized but unrecognized gain. And again, here we ask ourselves the same two questions we always ask ourselves. First, was this upstream or downstream? Um, upstream and downstream is based upon, traditionally, who the, who the issuer was. Little was the bond issuer, so we're going to view this as upstream. And so the non-controlling interest is going to get 20% of that $600. The other 80%, or 480, goes to the parent's share. And here we ask ourselves that second question. Is the parent using the full equity method, or the partial equity method, or the cost method? Let's assume they're using the partial equity method which means we have to adjust retained earnings for their share. So again, this year we're carrying forward $600 of realized but unrecognized gain. 
we're going to recognize $100 of that, so next year we're going to carry forward $500. We, again, once we get this first year down, we start this nice repetitive pattern over and over again. Next year, you know, what's going to change here? Again, straight laminarization keeps things real simple. The premium is going to drop by another $300, down to $1,200. Likewise, the investment in bonds is going to drop by another $200, down to $100, 800 so after plugging those things in, the missing value here will be 500, which we again split 2080 between the not joint parent shareholders and the parents portion. Okay, hope that hope that helps.